Greetings, brethren, and welcome to another week of our Sabbath School Lesson Discussion. I am Brother Brian, and with me, your usual team, Sister Akin and Sister Cherry Dean. This week, we are going to look at the topic, Faith Against All Odds. So we're going to learn about the life of the reformers, how they stood steadfastly for the truth, despite all the persecution that they faced despite it seeming like the whole world was against them. But before we continue, we're going to have a word of prayer. Our loving Father, we thank you that you have enabled us to be here again to speak upon your words of life. As we go through this lesson, we ask that you bring out just those things that we need for our spiritual growth and also for those of our hearers. Have your own way, we ask, and give us thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So, faith against all odds. Let's take a look at our memory text. Psalm 119, verse 11. It says, Thy word I have hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. So, the Protestant reformer that is something 21st century people desperately need a purpose for their lives. And when we look at how oh, earnestly and steadfastly they fought for that purpose, we know that they saw it as their very life itself. And so it is, it is my hope that myself and us as well gain inspiration from the account of their lives and experiences that will enable us to take full hold of this purpose now and to do whatever is needed to live up to the high calling that God has for us. So let's continue and gain some points on what it means to hold fast to that faith. Psalm 119 speaks about hiding God's word in our heart that we might not sin against it. Inspiration says if we would not be misled by error and falsehood, the heart must be preoccupied by the truth. The word of God will furnish the mind with weapons of divine power to vanquish the enemy. Happy is the man who, when tempted, finds his soul rich in the knowledge of the scriptures, who finds shelter beneath the promises of God. So we are to be this happy person who finds shelter in God's promises. If we hold steadfastly to his word. Inspiration says often he, referring to Christ, was asked, Why are you so set in being singular from us? He was asked by his peers. It is written, was his reply. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. So Christ left a steadfast ex example for us even in, in his use. And inspiration further counsels us to study the Bible diligently and prayerfully. Thy word, says the psalmist, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. This was Christ's example even in his younger years. We need also to be often found at the throne of grace. Earnest, persevering prayer. Uniting our human weakness to omnipotence will give us the victory. So we are often to be found at the throne of grace, especially knowing the time which, in which we live. It says, earnest, persevering prayer, uniting our weakness to omnipotence. And we know that is also putting our faith into action, doing whatsoever is asked and of us our part, on our part. Faith and works being combined. That inspiration says will give us the victory. And all of us truly want, would want to live victorious lives in this world, especially in Christ. So let's continue to some more important thoughts. Inspiration says God calls for men and women of stability a firm purpose who can be relied upon in seasons of danger and trial, 
were as firmly rooted and grounded in the truth as the eternal hills, who cannot be swayed to the right or to the left, but who move straight onward and are always found on the right side. And when we look at all these characteristics, we, we can think of all those steadfast reformers, Martin Luther being one great example of them his unwavering fidelity to the truth and his steadfast stance that he took against the whole Romish church, even though they threatened even his life. So we must come nearer to God, place ourselves in closer connection with heaven and carry out the principles of the law in the minutest actions of our everyday lives in order to be spiritually whole. So unless we carry out the principles of the law, unless we act out our part in the minutest actions of our everyday lives, we cannot be spiritually whole. This means that prior and face cannot do for us what we are to do on our part for ourselves. We are to work in cooperation with God while we pray and exercise faith in him. Let's go on from here. So here's a very good thought from inspiration pertaining to having faith even in the most trying times when all odds seem against us. It says, in the darkest days when appearances seem most forbidding, have faith in God. He is working out his will, doing all, things in, doing all things well in behalf of his people. The strength of those who love and serve him will be renewed day by day. So it's saying when things seem the most like it's not going our way, put it in my words. That is when we should have faith in God because he's still working. He never slumbers nor sleeps. So it is at the times when we believe he's not doing, when we believe he's most inactive, that he's actively working on our behalf. He is able and willing to bestow upon his servants all the help they need. He will give them the wisdom which their varied necessities demand. So in, as scripture says, as our days so shall our strength be. God will give us the wisdom which our daily necessities demand, our varied necessities demand on a daily basis. So if we hold fast to this promise, regardless of the circumstances and situations we face, we will keep in mind that God is working most earnestly in it for our good. All things is working for our good. So we're going to move on to the week's lessons. Dealing with the foundation of our faith. And uh, other important topics. But we'll move on now to Sunday, which Sister Aiken will bring us through. Thank you very much, Brother Brian. Sunday's lesson, God's Word alone. So you just talk about faith against all odds. And here we're going to be looking at God's Word alone. So quite naturally, God's word alone will help us to stand in time of great odds. And we saw that it did happen with the reformers. They stood on the word of God. All right, so we have Psalm 119, 103, 104, 147, 162 to study. Then the question is asked, what was David's attitude toward God's word? 
How did this impact the reformers and how does it influence our lives today? Well, it says here in the lesson that the Bible was the foundation of the reformers' faith and the essence of their teaching. They understood that they were handling the inspired word of God, which lives and abides forever, according to 1 Peter 1, 23. So they treasured every word. And of course, they heard what Jesus said. For Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And thus the reformers live, and so we are to live today as well. Then there's a question at the bottom. In what ways have the scriptures comforted you in times of trial? This is a very personal question which we all need to contemplate. So we'll move forward and get into reading these scriptures and get into the details of what they are saying. So we'll begin by reading Psalm 119, verse 104, sorry, 103, and then 104. And it says, 103, how sweet are thy words unto my late, sorry, let me go again. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Verse 147, I prevented the dawning of the morning and cried. I hoped in thy word. And 162, I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. So here the psalmist is telling us that the word of God is sweeter than honey. And he's anxious to hear God's word. He said, through that precepts, I get understanding. And he wants to get understanding. All right. So these verses are very plain. But let us hear a few more statements from inspiration. And we're reading from letters and manuscripts. For letter 31, 1891, paragraph 20. And inspiration says, the psalmist prayed, open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. And the Lord regarded his sincere prayer for the sacred record records his satisfaction in the truth revealed to him. He says, how sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth, more than to be desired than gold, yea, they are, yea than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, than the honeycomb. Psalm 119, 18, 103, and 19, verse 10. So here the psalmist depended on God's word, and he was anxious to have God's word. And just as God answered his prayer, so God will answer our prayer today as well. When we ask him, when we pray to God and ask him to open up his words to us or open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of his law, he will answer us. He's anxious to show us wonderful things. Are we anxious to receive them? We should be. So let's go forward and get into some more details. So now we are looking at how God's word inspired the, the reformers the impact it had on them. And we're reading from the Great Controversy, page 249, and it says, the grand principle maintained by the reformers, the same that had been held by the Waldenses, by Wycliffe, by John Huss, by Luther, Zwingli, and those who united with them, was the infallible authority of the Holy Scriptures as a rule of faith and practice as a rule of faith and practice. It was not the exception, but it was the rule. They lived by the word of God in practice and in theory. They taught the word of God and they lived the word of God. So inspiration continues. The Bible was their authority and by its teaching, they tested all doctrines and all claims. 
Faith in God and his word sustained these holy men as they yielded up their lives at the stake. They have good comfort, exclaimed Latimer to his fellow martyr as the flames were about to silence their voices. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. So here was one encouraging his fellow. They were both at the stake. They were both in the flames or going into the flames and the other comforted the one or the one comforted the other by saying, be of good cheer. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England, a candle that I trust shall never be put out. And it had not been put out. The reform is continuing. Yes, there's a lull for the ones who are to keep the candle burning as falling asleep. But God will have a few, and he does have a few to keep that, who are keeping that candle alight. So reading from letters and manuscripts again, letter 122, page 1896, paragraph, sorry, not page, but the year 1896, paragraph 12. Inspiration says, we cannot be safe unless the word of God is to us a treasure. So this is what it will do for us. It is a treasure. Unless we cannot be safe, unless, <coughs> sorry, the word of God is to us a treasure found and appreciated. More precious than gold or silver. Stored up in the mind and heart, it becomes a well of water springing up into everlasting life. No matter how much we draw from this living fountain, we cannot diminish the supply. By studying the word of God, we gain a knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, whom to know aright is life eternal. So, what impact or influence it has on our lives? We, when we study and appreciate it, it is like a well of water springing up into our hearts. And we will gain eternal life if we do like the reformers, practice what we study and learn. Let's move forward and get into some more details. So inspiration says from the book, My Life Today, we all need a guide through the many straight places of life as much as the sailor needs a pilot over the sandy bar or up the rocky river. The sailor who has in his possession chart and compass and yet neglects to use them is responsible for placing the lives of those on board his vessel in peril. Did you hear that, Bridget? Let me read that again. We all need a guide through the many straight places of life as much as the sailor needs a pilot over the sandy bar or up the rocky river. The sailor who has in his possession chart and compass and yet neglects to use them is responsible for placing the lives of those on board his vessel in peril. Do you know what that is saying to us? The Bible is our chart and compass. And if we fail to use it, if we neglect it, we are responsible for those around us who will die in their sins. For we are the light bearers and we have the chart and the compass. We have the light. And if we fail to shine it, if we fail to point the, the, the wayward traveler in the right direction, then their sins will be on our shoulder. If the watchman fail to blow the trumpet, and the city be taken by the enemy, whose fault is it? The watchman may it not be so with us. So inspiration continues. We have a guidebook, the word of God, and we are inexcusable if we miss the way to heaven. For plain directions have been given us. The Bible presents a perfect standard of character. It is an infallible guide under all circumstances, even to the end of the journey of life. 
Continuing from Steps to Christ, page 88, Jesus said of the Old Testament scriptures, and how much more is it true of the new? They are they which testify of me, the Redeemer. Him in whom our hopes of eternal life are centered. Yes, the whole Bible tells of Christ. From the first record of creation to the closing promise, behold, I come quickly. We are reading of his works and listening to his voice. If you would become acquainted with the Savior, study the Holy Scriptures. Fill the whole heart with the words of God. They are the living water, quenching your burning thirst. They are the living bread from heaven. Steps to Christ, page 88. And what did our Mary text say? Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. So may we hide God's word in our heart, that we may not sin against him and sin against our fellow men. Let's move forward for our next comment. And this is where we will leave you for Sunday's lesson. And this is a summary of what we have already gone through. So we see here from Jeremiah 15, 16, that the Bible says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Now this was the prophet Jeremiah speaking. Can we say the same thing with confidence and with sincerity today? I pray so. Yes, so by believing in his promises, we renew our faith and courage. Its leaves are like the fruit of the tree of life. That is the word of God. Its leaves are like the fruit of the tree of life. It radiates joy, hope, and light. It gives us direction, certainty, strength, and wisdom. Livens, livens our being physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And I remember 3 John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. And I dare to say it gives us financial stability as well. So in those dark times, the dark ages, the Bible saturated their lives to the point of giving their lives. Sorry. The Bible saturated the lives of the reformers to the point of giving their lives to remain faithful to its teachings to the point that they, sorry, some words have been missing here. Let me read that for you again. In those dark times, the Bible saturated the lives of the reformers and it brings them to the point where they even gave their lives for its teachings. And today, does it also saturate my life? Does it saturate yours? This is what should happen. The Bible should saturate our lives. We need to study the Bible and allow it to saturate our lives. And this is where we end for today, Sunday. I pray you have been blessed. Brother Brian, it's back to you. Thank you very much, Sister Aiken. May we indeed study the Bible and allow it to saturate our lives as we seek to obey its teachings. Now we'll move on to Monday's lesson which Sister Cherry Dean will bring us through. Thank you so much. I am happy to be able to present once again by God's grace. So we are looking at passing on God's words. Passing on God's word. And we are given 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the first um, verses 1 to 6. And we are given 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14. The question that was asked is what do this passage tells us about the confidence Paul had despite the challenges he faced in proclaiming the truth of God's word. We, we all know that every person who have entered and accepted God as a personal savior and is living up to his words are going to be filled with 
a lot of, of persecution, a lot of difficulties. So let's take a look at what Paul wrote. It says, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received the mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, not handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servant, servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness had shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So what do these verses tell us about Christ, um, Paul's confidence? Inspiration tells us in the book, The Acts of the Apostles, is that Paul was now full of faith and hope. He felt that Satan was not to triumph over the work of God in Corinth. And in words of praise, he poured forth the gratitude of his heart. He and his fellow laborers would celebrate their victory over the enemies of Christ and the truth by going forth with new zeal to extend the knowledge of the Savior. Amen. Like incense, the fragrance of the gospel was to be diffused through the world. To those who should accept Christ, the message should be a savor of life unto life. But to those who should persist in belief, a savior of death unto death. And this is why Paul says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Now, 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Now thank be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and make manifest the savior of his knowledge by us in every place. These words of Paul inspiration comments on 2 Corinthians chapter 2 do not denote a spiritual pride but a deep knowledge of Christ as one of God's messengers sent to confirm the truth of the word he knew what was truth and with the boldness of a sanctified conscience he glorified in the knowledge, in that knowledge. He knew that he was called of God to preach the gospel with all assurance, which his confidence in the message gave him. He was called to be God's ambassador to the people. And he preached the gospel as one who was called. In the matchless gift of his son, God had encircled the world, the whole world with an atmosphere of grace as real as the air which circulates around the globe. All who choose to breathe this life-giving atmosphere will live and go up to the stature of men and women in Christ Jesus. Isn't this amazing? When the grace of God reigns within the soul, the soul will be surrounded with an atmosphere of faith and courage and Christ-like love. And this is what Paul had. This is what Paul had. An atmosphere in invigorating to the spiritual life of all who inhale it. Those who are humbling heart, the Lord will use to reach souls whom the ordained ministers cannot reach. They will be moved to speak with words which reveal the saving grace of Christ. 
and in blessing others, they will themselves be blessed. God give us the opportunity to impart grace that he may refill us with increased grace. Isn't that what we want? This is what gives Paul confidence. He had that confidence that God's word will triumph despite what the enemy was trying to do. Hope and faith will strengthen as the agent for God's, for God works with the talents and facilities that God has provided. He will have a divine agency to work with him. Now we are told to read Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3 and Revelation 14, 30. And we are asked, how do these texts apply to Tyndale's life in a powerful way? So let's take a look at it and see what inspiration brings out. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And you know, this text that talks about the wise shall, shall shine as the brightness. Do you know it is more for us who are living in the last day? as Daniel chapter 12 is fulfilled, that it applies more to and impacts us more. This applies to us just as much as it did to those who have gone before. Isaiah 61, Psalms 83, 147 verse 4, Daniel 12, 3. Now inspiration says, each to give his measure of light. Every shining star which God has placed in the heavens obeys his mandate and gives its distinctive measure of light to make beautiful the heavens at night. So let every converted soul show the measure of light committed to him. And as it shines forth, the light will increase and grow brighter. Give out your light, pour forth your beams mirrored from heaven. O daughter of Zion, arise and shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. And this is taken from Isaiah 61. God wants us to arise and shine, for he has given us light, light that will lighten our part. And that's why it says, they that are wise shall shine, shine as the brightness of the firmament, as the, as the stars. This is what God wants for us. In a world full of darkness, gross darkness, we are to shine. We are to be a light. But the word of God grew and multiplied. The word of God is to be practiced. Let me read that again. All right. It says, the word of God is to be practiced. It will live and endure forever. While worldly ambition, worldly projects, and the greatest plans and purposes of men will perish like the grass, they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as stars forever and ever. Revelation 14, 13 says that I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. From henceforth, yea, said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works to follow them. So all who have gone before, their names are still mentioned. Their works has gone before them. Just like Tyndale, inspiration says in Great Controversy, page 246, Tyndale replied, I defy the Pope and all his laws. And if God spare my life, ere many years, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow to know more of the scripture than you do. The purpose which he had begun to cherish of giving to the people, the New Testament scriptures in their own language was now confirmed and he immediately applied himself to the work. 3,000 copies of the New Testament was soon finished and another edition 
followed in the same year. Tyndale, however, however, was betrayed into the hands of his enemies and at one time suffered imprisonment for many months. He finally witnessed for his fate by a martyr's death. And this is what it is saying wrong here. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Tyndale had died in the Lord. Amen. But the weapons which he prepared have enabled other soldiers to do the battle, to do battle through all the centuries, even to our time. And that is why we should appreciate the word of God. The things that those who have gone before us have went through. Just to be able to hold a copy, to be able to read it themselves. And we sometimes don't even read ours at times. Now think about your own life and your impact on others. What encouragement do these texts give regarding the opportunity? You have to influence others for eternity. Workers in the Lord's vineyard have the example of the good in all the ages to encourage them. Because guess what? They work, do follow them. They have also the love of God, the ministration of angels, the sympathy of Jesus, and the hope of winning souls to the right. They that be wise shall shine, we are, we are reminded, as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. The great head of the church has given talents to the company of believers. And who is that great head? Christ. He has given his word to mold the character and his spirit to bring all things to their remembrance. Because the spirit of God is going to bring to us the things that we have already known and sometimes have challenges remembering. It will bring to us freely. But if nothing is there, what is there to bring to our remembrance? So it is important that we study the word of God as we bring the curtain down on Monday and hand over to Brother Brian. Brother Brian. Amen. Thank you very much, Sister Cherry Fass, for able to bring us through Monday's lesson. May we seek to obey the word of God and share with it with others that we may be lights in the world that shine bright as stars in the firmament. Now we'll move on to Tuesday's lesson with Sister Aiken will bring us through. Thank you very much, Brother Brennan. And I love the, I love Revelation 14, 13. Blessed are the dead in Christ, for they shall rest from their labors and their works do follow them. If you and I should die before Christ comes, I pray that our works will follow us. For we would, we would have died in the Lord if our works follow us, right? So I pray that this will be our experience. We may not know it, but I pray that our influence will be such that others, when we are gone, if we should go before Christ comes, will be influenced by the works that we had done in our lifetime. So enlightened by the Spirit. Enlightened by the Spirit, Tuesday's lesson. And we have John 14, 25 and 26, John 16, 13 to 15, 2 Peter 1, 20 to 21. And the question is asked, what principles can we take from the following text regarding how we should interpret the Bible? But before we get into those scriptures, let's read a few paragraphs from the lesson. And it says, the reformers saw clearly that the Holy Spirit, not the priests, prelates, and popes, was the infallible interpreter of Scripture. There is an interesting exchange recorded between John Knox, the Scottish reformer, and Mary, Queen of Scots. Said Mary, ye interpret the Scriptures in one manner, and they, the Roman Catholic teachers, interpret it in another whom shall I believe and who shall be judge? And this is the answer from the reformer, John Knox. Ye shall believe God that plainly speaketh in his word. 
and serve the reformer. And farther, and farther than the word teaches you, ye neither shall believe the one nor the other. The word of God is plain in itself, and if there appear any obscurity in one place, the Holy Ghost, which is never contrary to himself, explains the same more clearly in, a, in other places, so that there can remain no doubt, but unto such as obstinately remain ignorant. And that reading came from David laying other places. Sorry, David Lang, the collected works of John Knox, quoted by Sister White in the Great Controversy, page 251. So what John Knox said, anything outside of the word of God, anything more or less than the word of God that is given by these people should not be taken. All we need is what is written in the word of God. Anyone who is going to teach us must teach us the word of God. And that is why we need to test every spirit, John tells us. And the, the word of God has given us what we call an acid test. Found in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, there is no truth in them. So whatever we hear, we need to test it against the word of God. Let's move forward and get into these verses from John chapter 14, 16 and 2 Peter 1. So we'll begin with John chapter 14, 25 and 26. And it says, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. This is Jesus speaking. And who did he say will teach us? The Pope, the priest, the prelate, the pastor, the teacher, the who? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. And in John chapter 16, 13 to 15, he says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. And Second Peter 1, 20 and 21 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Very clear. So let's move forward and get into some further details from the inspired writings. And we read in Steps to Christ. God intends that even in this life, the truths of his word shall be ever unfolding to his people. There is only one way in which this knowledge can be obtained. We can attain to an understanding of God's word only through the illumination of that spirit by which the word was given. And we just read in Peter that it was given by holy men as the spirit moved upon them. And here inspiration is telling us that it can be understood only by the Holy Spirit moving upon men. Not by any Tom, Dick, or Harry can I understand the scripture, but through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so it will be for you as well. The Spirit is the one who leads into truth. So let's continue reading from, amazing, from God's Amazing Grace, page 190, paragraph 3. God has communicated with men by his Spirit. And divine light has been imparted to the world by revelations to his chosen servants. And who are God's chosen servants? Peter says, again, for emphasis, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so as it was written by the Holy Ghost, 
or by holy men inspired by the Holy Ghost, so also it must be interpreted. For inspiration says in the book Desire of Ages 412 paragraph 3, through no wisdom or goodness of his own had it been revealed to Peter. Never can humanity of itself attain to a knowledge of the divine. It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell. What canst thou know? Quoting Job 11.8 Only the spirit of adoption can reveal to us the deep things of God, which I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man. So these are the secrets of God. For I hath not seen them nor ear heard them, neither have it entered into the heart of man. These are God's secrets, and by whom are they revealed to us? By the Holy Spirit, through his inspired servants. Let's move forward and see who are God's inspired servants. Amos 3, 7 tells us, Surely the Lord God will do nothing but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. His servants, the prophets, not the poor, nor the prelate, nor the pastor, nor the elder, nor the deacon, nor the lay member, but the Holy Spirit and the servant of God, the prophet. These are the two through whom God's secrets are revealed. Reading from Councils for the Church, page 9, paragraph 6, Inspiration says, Through these prophets, members of the human family have been led to an understanding of the conflict that goes on for the souls of men. The conflict between Christ and his angels and Satan and his angels. We are led to an understanding of this conflict in earth's closing days and of the means provided by God to care for his work and to perfect the characteristics of his people. And how do we learn these things? Through God's servants, the prophets. I would like us to take careful note. When Jesus went back to heaven, when he ascended up, he gave gifts unto men. Read it in I think it's in Ephesians chapter 4. We will not really get into that now, but it is good for us to go there and read it. So let's move forward and get into our next statement from Inspiration. So Inspiration says from the book, A Call to Stand Apart, 20, paragraph 2, the assertions and inventions of men are of no value. Let the word of God speak to the people. Let those who have heard only traditions and human theories and maxims hear the voice of him whose word can renew the soul unto everlasting life. And continuing in the book Desire of Ages, page 6, 671, Inspiration says, The preaching of the word will be of no avail without the continual presence and aid of the Holy Spirit. This is the only effectual teacher of divine truth. So brethren, let's pause a minute. If you want to learn, and I want to learn truth, how are we going to learn it? Who is going to be our teacher? The Holy Spirit. He is going to be our teacher. You cannot be my teacher and I cannot be your teacher. But the Holy Spirit is our teacher. He is the one Christ gave to teach us. So let's continue reading from inspiration. Only when the truth is accompanied to the heart by the Spirit will it quicken the conscience or transform the life. One might be able to present the letter of the word of God. He might be familiar with all its commands and promises. But unless the Holy Spirit sets home the truth, no souls will fall on the rock and be broken. No amount of education, no advantages, however great, can make one a channel of light without the cooperation of the Spirit of God. And as I read this, I remember in the Bible when Jesus asked, Whom do men say that I am? Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And how did Jesus say it was revealed to Peter? Through John the Baptist? Was it through any of the other disciples? No, it was through the Holy Spirit. Man hath not revealed it unto you, but the Spirit of God. That was what Jesus said to Peter. And that is exactly how you and I, brethren, 
are going to understand the scriptures. And with the aid of the prophets, the prophets and the Holy Spirit, they work together. So let's move forward and get into some more details. So reading from my life today, page 40, paragraph 3, the infinite one by his Holy Spirit has shed light into the minds and hearts of his servants. And who did we say are his servants? Amos 3, 7, the prophets. He has given dreams and visions, symbols and figures, and those to whom the truth was thus revealed have themselves embodied the thought in human language. Surely the Lord God will do nothing but he revealed his secret unto his servants, the prophets. In his providence, the Lord has seen fit to teach and warn his people in various ways, by direct command, by the sacred writings, and by the spirit of prophecy, has he made known unto them his will. In ancient times, God spoke to men by the mouth of prophets and apostles. In these days, he speaks to them by the testimonies of his spirit. There was never a time when God instructed his people more earnestly than he instructs them now concerning his will and the course that he would have them pursue. And do we know why God is so intensely interested in us? Why he is so intensely teaching and instructing us? Because we are in the last days. We are the people of the last few moments of earth's history. God's people. And God knows that the way ahead of us is strewn with trials. Well, remember, we are studying the great controversy. And God knows that as we get nearer to the end, it is going to be more, more terrible. So he has not left us to struggle along by ourselves. He has given us hope and he has given us his servants, the testimonies, to instruct us and to help us to stay in the narrow road. So let's continue reading. And I will just repeat this. There was never a time when God instructed his people more earnestly than he instructs them now concerning his will and the course that he would have them pursue. That means us. Of special value to God's church on earth today, the keepers of his vineyard are the messages of counsel and admonition given through the prophets who have made plain his eternal purpose in behalf of mankind. And brethren, if we fail to study the scriptures, if we neglect to study the scriptures, we are going to be guilty of our own blood, but we are going to be guilty of the blood of those around us whom we could have warned, whom we could have instructed and helped to cross over from Satan's battle, from, from Satan's castle to the kingdom of God. And this is where we leave you for today. I pray you have been blessed as I hand over back to Brother Brian. Brother Brian, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Sister Cherry. We will go on to Wednesday's lesson, which Sister Aiken will bring us through. My apologies, Sister Aiken. My apologies, brethren. The, the name should be reversed. I mean, Sister Cherry, I should say. Thank you so much, Brother Brian. You know, Brother Brian, I'm really enjoying the lesson. And Sister Aiken, that I truly love Tuesday. And I'm happy to see that the Lord has reminded us that he has a channel of inspiration. He has a channel through which his people should find light and feed, right? Oftentimes, we believe that we are, we can interpret the word, but God has his interpreter. He has his prophet, an instrument whom he chooses, not we. And where do we go? We go to this instrument to have clarity. If we all do that, we would be more in harmony. Don't you think that way? So now we are going straight over into Wednesday. Price alone, 
grace alone. So we are given Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9, Romans 3, 23 and 24, Romans 6, 23 and Romans chapter 5, 8 to 10. Text that we are very much familiar with, right? What do these verses teach us about the plan of salvation? So let's take a look at them. So we are told in the underlining that Martin Luther and the Protestant reformers discovered Christ and Christ alone as their source of salvation. And as we go forward, we are going to see how, how that was, right? Let us read Ephesians. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. 6.23 Romans 6 23 says, What for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And chapter 5, verses 8 to 10 says, But God commanded his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from the wrath through him. Isn't that wonderful? For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And I am so thankful, and I know that you're thankful too, that because of the blood of Christ, we were reconciled to God. Because remember, Sin has alienated us from him. But Christ came and reconciled us to God. So what do these verses teach us about the plan of salvation? John 3, 16 tells us what? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. His grace and his mercy is what saves us, Christ. Christ dying on the cross. God sending his son to die for us is what saves us. His only son. Not as many people saying today that Christ and, and Satan, his brothers, which we know are false. Christ, God's only son. But hear what steps to Christ tells us. None but the Son of God could accomplish our redemption. For only he who was in the bosom of the Father could declare him. Only he who knew the height and depth of the love of God could make it manifest. Nothing less than the infinite sacrifice made by Christ in behalf of fallen men. Man could express the Father's love to lost humanity. So in everything, Christ was given to us. If we want to know who God is, look at the life of Christ. Grace is an attribute of God exercised toward undeserving human beings. We did not seek for it, but it was sent in search of us. God rejoices to bestow his grace upon us, not because we are worthy, but because we are so utterly unworthy our only claim to mercy is our great need hmm. not because we love him did christ love us but while we were yet sinners he died for us he does not treat us according to our deserve although our sins have merited condemnation he does not condemn us. Year after year, he was born with our weakness and ignorance, with our ingratitude and waywardness. Nothing withstanding our wanderings, our hardness of heart, our neglect of his holy word. His hand 
is stretched out still. Despite of our unfaithfulness to him, despite that we are wayward and stubborn, we are stubborn. His hand is stretched to us and it is taken from ministry of healing. You see how important it is to have the, the writings of the spirit of prophecy. If salvation is the work of Christ, of God in Christ, what role do our works play in the Christian life? We are told, a faith that is not sustained by works is worthless, says the apostle. What doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say thou hast faith and have not works. Hmm. Show me thy faith. Show me thy faith without thy works. And I will show thee my faith by my works. That faith, if cherished in our hearts, will necessarily draw after it the good works which justify and endorse the faith of the believer. So, faith and works do what? They go hand in hand. Good works are indispensable as the fruit of faith and a sure evidence that we have passed from death unto life. Our faith should extend to our works. Not our works alone. Okay? And this is taken from Bible Training School, June 1st, 1915. How can we affirm the importance of God's works in our experience without making them the foundation of our hope? How can we affirm the importance of good works in our experience without making them the foundation of our hope? Now we read again from inspiration. Faith and works go together and each is dead if alone. Your faith without work is dead. Your works without faith is dead. Not that works will save you. They are the fruit of faith. And living faith will reveal itself in action. The hand of Christ is stretched forth to receive you. Will you put your hand in that of the dear Savior and say, lead me? I will follow thee, my Savior. You must not be neglectful of the condition of salvation. The conditions of salvation, which are faith and obedience. There must be a cooperation of the human with the divine. And this was taken from letters and manuscript. Seven letters and manuscript. So the Bible is available to everyone. As we read about Luther, we've been looking at Luther and John Knox. So now we are going to take a look at reformers whom god has given specific truths to reinforce back to his people right so let's take a look at luther knox wesley campbell miller and white so we know that luther came on the scene and when luther came on the scene this is what we are very much um, familiar with he taught the just shall live by faith the message Luther have was that of faith. Now we have John Knox. John Knox also, God gave him a doctrine. These, these were not new when it comes to Martin Luther, John Knox, John Wesley, and Alexander Campbell. These were not new. These were what was established and God has used these, these men his servants to bring about these truths in this way for us to have it back together. So Knox brought the truth of the Holy Spirit. Then we had John Wesley. John Wesley brought the doctrine of grace. Then we have Alexander Campbell. The doctrine taught by Campbell was baptism by immersion. And then we have the doctrine taught by William Miller, which was the prophecy of Daniel chapter 8, 14, which was the doctrine of the 2300 days, right? And then we have Ellen G. White. 
and the doctrine she brought was the truth about the Sabbath in connection with the judgment in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, this is so amazing that God used these men individually to bring about certain truth to his people. And we know that Luther, when he came, he when Luther came, there was the Lutherans and there was the Presbyterians and there was the Baptists and, and, and all these coming down the line. These were churches that God wants to work with. Not the Baptists we know today as spiritual Baptists and so. The Baptists as that what John Knox had bring. And then Campbell. And the thing is, when you read from inspiration, inspiration tell you that what John Knox brought was not contrary to what Martin Luther brought. He accepted what Martin Luther had. And so would Wesley. Wesley would have accepted what John brought and what Luther brought. And Campbell would have accepted, as God used them, they would have accepted the light of each. Now, when we reach down to the last, which is us as Seventh-day Adventists, we do have all of these. We believe in the, in the just shall live by faith. We believe in the, Holy, the working of the Holy Spirit, the truth and the Holy Spirit. We believe in grace, because we talk about it in the lesson this week with John Wesley. We believe that when persons are baptized, they should be baptized by what? Immersion. We believe in the prophecy of the 2300 days. We believe in the Sabbath. We believe that the judgment. All six of these doctrines are within our movement. Which means we would have accepted what Luther, Knox, Wesley, Campbell, Miller, and Sister White would have brought. No. As we learn, God has his what? His instrument to whom he uses. Thank you, Sister Cherry, for bringing us to Wednesday's lesson. Now we look at Thursday, obedience as the fruit of faith. We're asked to read Romans 3, verse 27 to 31, Romans 6, 15 to 18, and Romans 8, 1 to 2. So let's get into these texts and then look at the question we're asked afterwards. Romans 3, 27 to 31. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and answer circumcision through faith. Do we then make by the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be sung that ye were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Romans 6, 15 to 18. Now we'll go to... Romans 8, 1 to 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So we ask based on these texts of Scripture, what do these verses teach us about salvation through Christ's righteousness alone? Let's continue and gain some thoughts from inspiration. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It says we cannot even manufacture faith ourselves, it is the gift of God. The whole of our salvation comes through the gift of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Although we know that we have to do what we can on our part, but everything, all our salvation is a free gift from Christ. 
Without Christ, we can do nothing worthy of commendation. So without him, all our good works, all our good works are important. Without him, all our good works are of no value. The grace of God through Christ is ever to be cherished, for it is given us as the only way of approaching God. There is no other way of, for man's salvation. Without me, says Christ, he can do nothing. Through Christ and Christ alone, the springs of life can vitalize man's nature, transform his taste, and set his affections flowing toward heaven. So here we see the importance of Christ and his work for us. A sorrow work that leaves nothing undone and nothing we can do to save ourselves except through his saving grace. So let's continue and get into some more details. So we are saved by grace alone. That's what the first of three fundamental principles that emerge from Ephesians 2 verse 8. Second says this means to achieve grace is by faith alone. Third, this is the gift of God, which is the gift of his son, Christ, Christ Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So because of our sin, we are condemned to eternal death. However, God has provided a way to pay our debt, our debt and give us eternal life. And why do we need God to pay our debt? Because we cannot pay it in any way. When Adam and Eve sinned, they lost the dominion that they had. And they lost all the righteousness that they could have attained to not only for them but for us as well it took christ who came and died as the second adam as scripture says to restore this privilege unto us and so it is only through christ that we can regain the privilege of righteous lives and righteous endeavors that lead to heaven when Martin Luther discovered that Christ was his only source of salvation, he began to preach that truth. Thousands who had been chained by the deceptions of the enemy were freed and transformed. And it's even much more important today, now that we have even millions today who are, who are chained by the deceptions of the enemy. We have a much larger work to do. And so we need more, more than Martin Luther did to understand the grace of Christ and to understand how to teach it to others as well. So let's continue. Although salvation is free, its cause was infinite that we all know and sufficient for all of us. So I further asked to read 1 Peter 2 verse 2, 2 Peter 3 verse 18, Colossians 1 verse 10, and Ephesians 4 verse 18 to 24. And we're asked what vital truth do these passages reveal about the Christian life? 1 Peter 2 verse 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Inspiration comments saying that we are to see and understand the instruction given us by the great apostle. As newborn babe desires the sincere milk of the word that he may grow thereby. In perception, in likeness to the character of Christ. Development of character, growth in knowledge and wisdom will be the sure result of feeding on the word. The milk represents the word, as, word of God as found in the Bible. God's work is, word is perfect, but without the shedding of the blood of Christ, it would, it would not profit us at all. Neither would the word and the blood help us if there was no life in the Son of God. 2 Peter 3 verse 18 says, But growing grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 
To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Let's continue into Colossians 1 verse 10. It says that he might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in knowledge of God. In Ephesians 4, 18 to 24, further goes on to say, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful loss, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God, after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So it is not a small matter to transform an earthly sin-loving mind and bring it to understand the unspeakable love of Christ, the charms of his grace and the excellency of God, so that the soul shall be imbued with divine love and captivated with the heavenly mysteries. It is not a small matter. It is a great, wondrous miracle of God. When he understands these things, his former life appears disgusting and hateful. And we can apply it, apply it to us when we understand these things. Our former life appears disgusting and grateful and hateful. He hates sin and breaking his heart before he hates sin and breaking his heart before God. He embraces Christ as the life and joy of the soul. He has a new mind, new affections, new interest, new will. His sorrows and desires and love are all new. This is the experience we are to have and we should have if we are being transformed by the grace of Christ through the gospel of Christ. May God help me and us all to have this experience which is so very much needed that we may be transformed in order that we can go out and more effectively work to to bring bring the gospel to others by our both our word and example that they may be transformed as well. So let's continue into some more input. Let's look at John Wesley. He was one of the founders of the Methodist movement was moved by the, by reading Luther's introduction to Romans. It says his new faith led him to seek growth in grace. Knowing himself saved by grace did not lead him to despise the law, but to study it more carefully so that his life would be increasingly in harmony with the life that Christ expected of him. This is an important thought because there are some in the world that go to the extreme to say that because Christ has died to save us by his grace, then we have no need to keep the law. We have no need to obey all the commandments of God because Christ does everything for us. It frees us from doing anything on our part. But that is not how John Wesley saw it. And it was far before our time now. He at that time saw things in their true light. So it's very sad that also that persons who are living at a later time do not understand the truth of these things. It says the purity, the holiness, the purity, the holiness of the life of Jesus as represented before presented from the word of God possess more power to reform and transform form the character than do all the efforts put forth in picturing sins and crimes of men and the sure results. One steadfast look to the Savior uplifted upon the cross will do more to purify the mind and heart from every defilement than will all the scientific explanations by the ablest tongue. 
So motivation to cooperate with God for our transformation should come from our constantly picturing Christ dying for our sins, going through the greatest form of humility and degradation just for restoration. And by so doing, we are to seek to obey him out of love so that his grace may be imparted to us as a free gift, but also based on our obedience to his life and character, to exemplify his life and character. The purity of Christ has revealed to him his own impurity in his odious colors. He turns from the defiling sin. He looks to Jesus and lives. And that is what we are called to do today. We are to look at the serpent lifted up in the wilderness, a representation of Christ. And by looking at him, we are to be charmed by, by his character and to seek to exemplify that character in our daily life so that we may be transformed by his grace and become Christ-like in person not only in profession. May God help that this is our desire as we seek to fight the good fight of faith despite whatever odds we face. Now let's move on to Friday and read our closing thought. Inspiration says reformers are not destroyers. They will never seek to ruin those who do not harmonize with their plans and assimilate to them. So while we are seeking to exemplify the life of the reformers, we are to have a true understanding of what it means to be like them, to truly be a reformer for God. We are not destroyers, we are restorers. Scripture calls us repairs of the breach. We're not called to condemn and destroy the lives of others, but to preach the gospel in order that they by their obedience can be saved. Reformers must advance, not retreat. They must be decided, firm, resolute, and flinching. But firmness must not degenerate into a domineering spirit. So while we are to stand firmly for the truth, we are also to do so with the Christ-like love that is uh, accepted of God. We are to do so in Christ's character. God desires to have all who serve him firm as a rock where principle is concerned, but meek and lowly of heart as was Christ. We are not to needlessly condemn and expose the errors of others except as it may be necessary to bring them to the light of the truth and to bring others out of the error of darkness that they are leading them into. Then, abiding in Christ, they can do the work he would do were he in their place. A rude condemnatory spirit is not essential to heroism in the reforms for this time. So some of us may see ourselves as reformers and we take delight in behaving like this, rude and condemnatory. And we actually enjoy when we are able to treat others in such a way. When we are able to expose their faults and errors. If we should examine our hearts at times, we do not do it out of, a, out of a true desire for them to be saved. But so that we may triumph in the fact that we are earnestly fighting a warfare against them. But this is not the spirit that Christ asks us to have. All selfish methods in the service of, of God are an abomination in his sight. So the gospel that we preach should be devoid of self. 
there should not be any selfish gratification that we get from uh, preaching the truth and exposing the faults and errors of others. We should do it with the desire to see them saved. And if we examine what we are doing and see that it is not for that purpose, it is not having that effect, then we need to, we ourselves need to reform in our habits and ways and means of evangelizing and of sharing the truth. So may God help me and help us all in this aspect as we close on this week's lesson. Now Sister Aiken is going to close us with a word of prayer. Thank you very much, Brother Brian. Let us pray. Our kind, loving Father, we give thee thanks and praise for the privilege that we have had to present this lesson, learning and helping others to learn. We thank thee, Lord, for thy intense interest in us. And as we ponder these things, help, O oh God, that they will be the means to help us perfect that Christ-like character which we need to enter into eternal life. We ask, Lord, that you'll be with your people all across the world. May minds and hearts be turned from sinfulness to Christ-likeness. And may we all be privileged to attain a place in thy kingdom when Jesus shall come. In Jesus' name we pray and say thanks. Amen. Thanks for viewing, brethren. God bless you. Bye from Sabbath school until next time.